Well, good evening everyone. And a warm word of welcome to you uh, along here to the church tonight. It's great to see you all. I uh, huddle together in different parts of the building. If you feel cold, uh, uh, just all come closer <laughs> if you want. But it's great to see you all uh, out tonight. And that's the very first evening service of the year. It was always a tough time of the year to, to leave the fire and that whenever it is so cold and dark. Uh, so thank you for coming. And um, hopefully if you didn't get a sheet this morning for the announcements, there are more printed there for this evening. And uh, in there to remind us uh, if the midweek starts again this week, Wednesday night, 8 o'clock, where we're going to be continuing um, a parallel study in the book of uh, Revelation. And the new members courses are also in there. Do, if you know of anyone who's been thinking about becoming uh, a new member of the congregation, like a communicant member of the congregation, uh, make them aware of the dates that are in the announcements. And those can be viewed on our Facebook page. And also there's now a link on, the f on our homepage and our website where you can get them. They go there as soon as they go on Facebook as well. Well, those are all our announcements. Um, we rise this evening to sing our a psalm from Portland on Psalms uh, to open our service from Psalm 32 and uh, let us rise to worship God as we sing the psalm of sins forgiven. Let's praise God. <laughs>
our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the psalm of testimony that shares the story of the psalmist. But the days before he was converted, whenever the weight of the guilt of his sin weighed heavily upon him, and how in your grace and mercy you led him to repentance, to confess his transgressions to you, and to receive your gracious pardon which you gave him and through which you took that burden of guilt off of him and although little known to him at that time you laid it upon a savior the lord jesus christ the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world and lord we also glean from the psalm that whenever we have a testimony like that we have a responsibility with it too and that is to share our faith and to point others to the same um, Saviour. And we ask, Lord, that you would thrill us and give us the confidence to do this too if we, if we are in possession of salvation in Christ. And Lord, for all who are still without, Lord, may this song of, of testimony really, really woo the heart to Jesus. Make, to make the sinner envious, the sinner who's still not saved, envious. They have the same great pardon and salvation. The joy of sins cancelled. The power of sin broken. The dominion of sin over one's life to be no more. Lord, we give you thanks for this gospel. And Lord, we know that before we can really appreciate how much Jesus has done for us, we need to know how bad a case of sin it is that we have. And Lord, as we meditate upon this a very area of doctrine this evening, Lord, it may not be that, it is, that it's one that would depress us, but rather one that leaves us wondering, what a saviour, and with widened imagination and grasp of what it is Jesus has done for us, the extent of the salvation he has wrought for us on the cross when he saved us. So Lord, we commit our meditations tonight um, to you. We pray for the guidance and help of the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. And that, Lord, guide us as we would hear your words read from the scriptures as well. And we ask for this help now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we turn to our Bible reading for tonight. It's Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And reading from verse 12. Must be round about page 1132, but um, this isn't actually a pew Bible. It's just very close to one. Romans chapter 5, and reading from verse 12 through to 19. Let's hear from God's holy and precious word. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin, by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin, the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass, 
was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Now I'm end this reading. God's holy and an errant word. And don't be worried if you find that hard to follow. Like everyone finds that passage uh, quite a bit of mental work to go through it and follow it, the argument there. But we'll be studying that a little bit in a moment or two. And, uh, but before we do, let us sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Father, as we come to meditate now upon your word and upon the doctrine that is sometimes referred to as that of the total depravity of the human race, we ask, Lord, that you would give us humble, receptive hearts. Lord, be with our minds. Help us to be able to understand more and more of the concepts that we'll be speaking about. And Father, also give rise to the questions that, that we need answered as well, that we may be able to engage with those two. And so, Lord, um, help us, lead us into your truth tonight, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, in 1560, I want to take you back uh, 500 odd years, nearly 500 years, a famous theologian by the name of Jacobus Arminius was born. And he was born and raised as a Protestant. And he studied under the theologian Theodore Beza, who was the immediate successor to John Calvin. So he had a pretty illustrious theological education in Geneva, in the school there. And at first, Arminius was a very strict Calvin. He soaked it all in. And he was greatly praised by his tutors uh, and by Beza himself. And then the time came for him to be called to his own pastorate. Um, and he returned to his native the Netherlands to take up a post in Amsterdam. And he did that, it was around the, the late 1580s. But it was only within two or three years that, that Arminius began to preach some things that began to deviate from the Reformed truth that he had been schooled in. For example, he began to teach that mankind still has a free will after the fall and that the impact of what is known as original sin is perhaps not as severe as, as has been taught by the reformers so far and that God doesn't elect people in an absolute way without any input or indication or reading of what that person will be like. No, God actually can see in advance, can foresee who's going to be good, who's going to respond, who's going to show faith, and those are they who may be called the elect. And it's only because of God's foreknowledge that he knows who those individuals will be. Which is a very dangerous doctrine because it, it means that after all, Sinners have something to contribute to their salvation. There was some spark. There was something in the sinner that attracted God to write their name down before they were born and count them in the elect. So these are some of the ideas that Arminius began to espouse and to propagate. And they very quickly got him into to trouble. His ideas spread like wildfire right through the Netherlands and throughout Europe and even to right out to the international Protestant community as well. And those ideas kept spreading and spreading until eventually, which was actually some nine years after his death in 1618, the States General of the Netherlands summoned a special international meeting called a Synod. And that meeting was called, if I go the right direction, the Synod of Dort, which spread over um, the year 1618 to 19. And this was called to address these theological questions that Arminius had raised and which still continued some nine years after his death. This meeting had some 84 members and also 18 political delegates from around, around the world, the Protestant world. And the followers of Arminius were gathered and they weren't members of this synod. They were rather defendants before this synod. So it was very much like a courtroom scene. And here's an artist's impression of what it looked like. And the, the, the um, synod are all the seats around the peripheral, uh, around the sides and at the very top table. And the table in the center was where there, those who followed Arminius's ideas uh, were invited to sit and uh, to, to defend. Now, the, those who followed Arminius were called, they began to be known as the, the remonstrants. And the, rem the word remonstrance simply means someone who vigorously opposes something. And what they were vigorously opposing was essentially what we know today as Calvinism. And the, what we know as the doctrines of grace, which we'll be looking at in a moment or two. Back to the Senate of Dort, though, there, as I say, were these 84 members, 18 political delegates. And they had 154 sessions as a council, as a synod, and many more conferences around the sides um, as well throughout this period as they tried to refute our, our many ideas. 
and which they did ultimately successfully. Now, the theologian Louis Burkhoff, who's written history of some of this information, or some of these events, said this. He said, it was the most representative body they ever met. So it was a bit like one of the councils that we see, or the first council of the church that we see in Jerusalem, do you remember? Whenever there was the query over whether uh, new Gentile converts should be circumcised or not, should observe the Mosaic law or not, and that the question just rippled through churches everywhere. And so a council was called, representative of all the branches, all the the local churches that there were in the then um, the church, and in order to get the collective opinion and as wide a representation as possible to, to seek God's mind on this and from the word of God. And so that's what was going on. And the result was it rejected, this synod rejected all the ideas of the remonstrance. They had summarized their doctrinal points into five articles and all five were rejected. And that wasn't all they did, just to reject these arguments, and they also published um, a restatement of the very doctrines that had come under attack. And those re- that restatement of these doctrines was known as the Canons of Dort, and uh, they also later came to be known as the Five Points of Calvinism. So Calvin didn't write the Five Points of Calvinism. They were this formulation of Reformed doctrine. And it's the Five Points of Calvinism in particular that came under attack during this period of time under the, through the, um, against the ideas of, um, or by the ideas of uh, Ar- Arminius. And they have also since then come, come to be known as the doctrines of grace, uh, which is a much more uh, agreeable um, and welcoming phrase and title than the five points of, of Cal- Calvinism, perhaps. Now, these doctrines were not invented in the 17th century. It wasn't that this, whenever they were stated in this way, that that was the, they were a novelty, they were a new thing. They were simply a restatement of the doctrine, the reform doctrine that was adhered to, was um, um, adhered to by both the Lutheran and the Reformed or Calvinistic wings of the Reformation. But they didn't, weren't the originators of it either. Of course, it goes back to the fifth century and there, there were doctrines that already were in print uh, from the pen of St. Augustine. Um, the early church father, and neither though was he the originator of these doctrines that we're going to be looking at in this series, for of course they rest squarely upon the New Testament and the apostolic doctrine that we find um, in the Bible, especially in particular the New New Testament. Today these doctrines um, have been, we have them in a very helpful acrostic that helps us to remember them, that's quite famously known as tulip which is an acrostic which stands for these, these five phrases, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And that may seem like code language for you, or maybe you know exactly what these are, um, but thought it would be really helpful for us to refresh our memories at the very least um, as to what these doctrines are that have been so challenged down through the history of the church and which, for which the reformers um, worked so hard to retain and to, to defend, including later um, generations uh, of the church, and no, notably here the, the um, Synod of Dort. We must say too that this isn't, when we say, use that phrase, the, you know, the five points of Calvinism, this does not mean that this was the sole body of doctrine that the reformers recovered far far from it because the reformers recovered many doctrines and not least the doctrine regarding uh, supremacy of the word of God and the all sufficiency of the Bible you'll see that that's not mentioned in Chilip it's because that's not what was challenged um, at this period of time um, so these are the five in particular that were that were challenged it's not an exhaustive list of reformed doctrine it's just five that have and to this day continue to be challenged um, in the church. So tonight we are going to look at the first of them, total depravity. Um, what does that mean? It has to be admitted that on face value it doesn't sound very attractive. And there are even many reformed people who think it's not the best way to state the doctrine um, or to label it. 
So we are, do need to get to the bottom of what, what exactly ref, um, theologians mean by this phrase and this title. One helpful summary statement of this doctrine of total depravity is from Dr. Robert Raymond. And he says this. I don't worry if you don't get it all the first time. We'll be coming back to this several times. So it reads, Both because of original sin and their own acts of sin, all mankind, accepting Christ in their natural state, are thoroughly corrupt and completely evil, though they are restrained from living out their corruptness in its fullness by the instrumentalities of God's common grace. Accordingly, they are completely incapable of saving themselves. Quite a definition. And you'll see that there are two main sources, um, two main aspects that condemn humanity, original sin and humanity's own acts of sin. These two ways in which humanity is polluted, polluted by, by sin. Now, so the Bible teaches that we inherit sin from Adam in these two different ways. And uh, it really what this is, is what this doctrine is, is a description of the effect that the fall has had on us, even before we're born, and what, what the effect that the fall has had on all humanity. We, are, we have this inherited depravity, this inherited sin and guilt. First of all, guilt. We inherit guilt because of, of Adam's sin. In Romans 5 verse 12, which we'll put up here, Paul teaches this. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, there's the punishment for sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. So from that moment when Adam and Eve sinned, all humanity that followed God seen, it, seen us all corporately as having sinned. It's a very broad brush statement we might think, um, but it's borne out in the passage, further in the passage that we read uh, in Romans 5. For example, verse 18 it says, One trespass, that's Adam's sin, led to condemnation for all men. That's the guilt that Adam incurred coming upon all humanity, all who would be born as human. And there's another statement of it in verse 19, by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So there's the guilt for sin being transferred. We might call it, it's sometimes called original sin, but that can be a little bit confusing because something original sin refers to the first sin that um, Adam committed. But that actually isn't what original sin is. It's referring to this inherited guilt that comes to us all because we're sons and daughters of, of Adam. Before uh, we um, struggle with that any further, um, we should say that um, this guilt, to use another word that will be helpful for us in a minute or two, was imputed to all people. It was imputed. And this guilt and to all who are born of Adam and Eve. And it can seem very unfair. We may say, how can you and I be guilty for the sin of somebody else? How can you say that we are guilty of Adam's, of Adam's sin? In the response, the Bible teaches that in addition to you know, original or inherited sin, we will also be judged for the sins that we have committed and are personally responsible for. For example, in Romans 2, verse 6, it, God's, we read, God will give to each person according to what he has done. But even though that level of responsibility is there, this guilt is still there and needs to be dealt with. The most powerful argument, I believe, for upholding this doctrine of inherited guilt is that it's through this very same setup that it becomes possible for the righteousness of one man to be imputed to the many as well. 
And that's the point that Paul makes again and again through his passage in Romans chapter 5. If we think it is unfair to be represented by Adam, and because he got it so badly wrong, we all suffer for it, if we think that's unjust, well then we would have to be consistent and say it's also unjust that Jesus Christ should also have to represent us on the cross and bear our sin. And then, so that it may be possible then um, for his righteousness to be imputed on the many either. It's actually because of this difficult to accept doctrine of inherited sin or original sin and guilt that our salvation is possible. That God has set humanity up to work this way through representation. And because of that first representation, the second works. Jesus is able to save us and to represent us on the cross and to have his righteousness imputed to every one of us. That's the first aspect of, an, of inherited sin, or the way that we are polluted by sin, um, this total depravity. The second aspect of it is that we, which doesn't need quite as much explanation, is that we inherit from sin a corrupt nature. And this is easier to prove because it's born out in every human life. Um, as soon as a child grows and, uh, and is old enough to assert their will in some way, it becomes clear that there's a selfishness and um, there's a sinful nature at work and it grows and grows and grows. So David referring to this nature, he said, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You say, but hold on, that's going back quite far. Um, how can you be sinful even from the time your mother conceived you? Is, is David here referring to something sinful that his mother did and how he was conceived? No, not a bit of it. He's referring to this doctrine of inherited corruption of sin that he has received through, through Adam. The point is often put this way when we talk about um, original sin. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And this is the pollution that, that we all are born with and that even if we never had the opportunity to sin, we were still sinners because that's um, our very nature and identity as a son and as a daughter, or as a daughter of Adam. To return to Robert Raymond's description, therefore, it summarizes these two, both because of original sin and their own acts of sin, all mankind, except in Christ and their natural state, are thoroughly corrupt and completely evil. Now that total depravity doesn't mean that every human being is as bad as they possibly could, could be. Because Raymond goes on to, to note here, they are restrained from living out their corruptness in its fullness by the instrumentalities pardon me, of God's common grace. God has placed restraining, gracious influences on us. Some of those influences and restraints are the rule of law, living in a country where there's a police uh, service and courts and so on that, that restrain um, selfish human nature as far as they can. There's limitation to how well they work, but they certainly restrain a fair bit. There are also the conventions of family life and of civil life that, that keep us in line to a fair degree too. And then there are the fact there is the fact that God has given us all a conscience, which also to a greater or lesser extent challenges us um, and depend on how sensitive our conscience is and, and to what degree we have seared our conscience um, through the practice of, of our sin. And so all these are evidence of what is called God's common grace. This, this kindness and goodness of God that all human beings have a measure of, whether they're Christian or not. Have you ever met someone who is like such a good neighbor, such a good guy, such a good colleague at work, such a good friend? And, and you know, you would think they were a Christian because of how morally they live and how good they are on so many levels. And yet they're not a Christian. Have you ever wondered how that could be? There are unbelievers out there who behave better than Christians. How can that be? Well, it's evidence of this 
common grace, this goodness of God, this remnant of the image of God that all human beings are made and bear, made in and, and bear. And it is a form of restraint, an influence for good upon humanity so that it doesn't become as utterly depraved as it has the potential to, but, but that doesn't mean that they are through and through good. Because what this doctrine of total depravity is saying is not that everyone is going to be as bad as they possibly can. It's saying that every part of the human existence is polluted. So our minds um, have this taint and pollution of sin. Our emotions, um, all our decision-making faculties, our motives, even down to the genetics of our body have been affected by the fall and by sin. And so that that's what total depravity is referring to, is the fact that every part of the human being has been polluted, has been tainted. It's total in that way. It doesn't mean utter in the sense that every human being is as, is, is, is as bad as, as they could possibly um, have the potential to be. So God made this assessment of humanity as far back as Genesis chapter 6. He said, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every, every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So yes, there are many restraints that manage our outward behavior. There's many societal um, norms that, that, that maybe keep us on the straight and narrow or within respectability. But God was looking on the heart and he could see that every human being at the level of the heart is corrupt and is this total depravity so that we have all the sinful thoughts of the day in here. It's like a well gushing up. I don't know if you remember, I was in the Gulf of Mexico whenever BP had that ruptured well. Do you remember the scenes on the camera of it gushing up? All this oil for weeks and weeks and weeks and they were seen powerless to stop it. It was without, beyond their reach to be able to get it capped for a long time. And that's what our hearts are like. They have this constant welling up of sin and sinful desires and sinful thoughts and sinful motives and dot, dot, dot. That's what this doctrine of total depravity is talking about. And it, it pollutes every aspect of our, of our being. Therefore, Paul could say, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So we lack the ability to do what is right before God, even if should we want to, or for whatever reason try to, we are unable to. So Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Or according to Robert Raymond, at the end of his definition, accordingly, they are completely incapable of saving themselves. So despite the, that latent measure of common grace and goodness that we find in every human being, we look hard enough, every human being still lacks the desire and the capacity to be able to please God and to even to seek him at all. As Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's the most tragic part of this doctrine of total depravity. No one. It results in no one coming to the Father of their own free will, because they don't have a free will, because the Gospels present us as being under the dominion of sin, children of wrath. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all without exception. This um, is the greatest proof that we all are totally depraved, the fact that we don't come to the God who made us and that we run, we run from him. We said at the very start as we finish that, you know, we won't, or it's like a, maybe it was in prayer, we cannot fully appreciate what Christ did for us on the cross until we appreciate this doctrine of how bad our human condition is, that we are so utterly lost in this way. That's what magnifies uh, the grace of Jesus and rescuing us and, uh, and, and magnifies the power of the cross to set us free. 
it magnifies the goodness of the good news in the, of the gospel. And it also makes sure that in our salvation, nobody gets credit but Jesus. Because we will never be able to say, well, in my free will, I chose Christ. That is never the case. God was the one who made the first move. And if you're in Christ, it's Christ that gets all the glory. And we cannot take any. Because as Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's a sketch of this doctrine of total depravity. And maybe you're now completely um, um, worn out. But does anybody have any questions arising out of what we've said? It's not good for me to be as high up here in the pulpit. I should be down on the floor. But don't be shy. Is anyone, any questions they would dare to If you have any questions, um, do write them down, do text them, because there are, uh, there was a lot of discussion around all this, of course. There are a couple of questions that get asked sometimes, such as if we are unable to choose God because of our sinful nature, how can we be held responsible, still be held responsible for our actions? Um, this problem uh, of justice, but... The reality is that God's standard for justice is his holy nature, is his own holy law. And no matter uh, what we have done, and no matter um, what level of responsibility we may have, we are still guilty and, and we are measured according to his perfect standard of his law. Another one sometimes is, well, is it our infants guilty before they commit sin? Are they you know, what if a child dies before they reach the age of understanding? What does this doctrine mean? Does this mean they're lost because they never were old enough to respond to the gospel? Well, that's probably the most pastoral questions that arise out of this doctrine. And, and they, the clear answer is that, that infants who die in, in infancy, child, children who die in infancy, especially in particular, the scriptures very clear and vocal on the case of infants of believing parents is that they go to heaven not because of any innocence that they have because they have this problem of inherited sin they are sinners who just haven't had the opportunity yet to sin they are in heaven only because of the merits of christ's blood that have been applied to them there is an, an example of an infant of a believer and in going to heaven um, in second samuel 12 it's actually the child that was conceived um, between uh, Bathsheba and David. And do you remember the little child died as a judgment on that inappropriate relationship that David had initiated? And whenever the child died, David said this, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. And there was David's confidence that that little child, while in judgment, the, the, his human life was lost yet he knew he was in heaven and he would meet that little one one day and, uh, and gather him up into his arms there are some other passages around that but if there's no other questions we will um, come to sing our final hymn which is hymn number 67 Jesus lover of my soul
Father God, we thank you for this great grace that you have shown towards us. And we acknowledge tonight that this great salvation is all entirely to be accredited to your grace and to the work of our Saviour Jesus. And that all we have contributed is our sin. We thank you that you chased after us. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit you convicted us of our sin, of the righteousness of Christ, and of the judgment to come. And Lord, we pray that you would make us to be heralds of this good news and of this wonderful salvation and grace shown us in Jesus. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us tonight and forevermore. Amen.